Thank you very much. Uh, this is my second visit to Taiwan, and I have to say, once again, I'm struck by the warm reception, the cordial uh, hospitality that I've received. I want to thank President Yang uh, for the invitation, co-sponsorship, and above all, uh, Alice and Hiskai, um, Zekai uh, for their uh, invitation. Today, I want to talk to you uh, about the uh, topic of creativity, innovation, and the humanities, uh, and focus specifically on the Stanford curriculum. I'm going to start out by presenting some of the research from economists in the United States uh, on education, innovation, and economic growth. I'm just going to touch very briefly on that before I then go on to talk about Stanford's approach to uh, curriculum, and in particular to the role of humanities and arts in the curriculum. I want to say straight off that I'm not an economist, I'm a Roman historian, and so I've depended on my colleagues, uh, particularly Professor Caroline Hoxby, who's a leading expert in the economics of education at Stanford. She guided me through some of the literature on higher education and economic growth. Economists have looked at a variety of issues connected with curriculum and, in particular, the, uh, the question of whether a broad general curriculum has benefits that a narrow skill-based curriculum does not. And I offer here on this slide uh, several bibliographical items that are relevant to that. I want to now uh, say a few words about those. Before I do, though, I, I want to offer a few definitions. To begin, I want to define the humanities. Now, this may seem obvious, but uh, I've come to find out that even some of my alumni who took degrees in economics and psychology describe themselves as alumni from the humanities. And uh, um, I define humanities more narrowly than that. Um, <laughs> For me, it's the study of literature, history, philosophy, art, music, and drama. And then I want to offer some definitions of creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. These are concepts that are linked, in my view, but I think that there are distinctions that are worth making. To start with creativity, I define that as the ability to transcend traditional ideas, rules, patterns, relationships, and the like, and to create meaningful new ideas, forms, methods, interpretations, etc. Creativity in and of itself doesn't imply that there's any concrete product from it. So, for example, it's possible to imagine a monk in a monastery uh, creatively thinking about theology and yet not producing anything as a result. Innovation, then, is defined as the introduction of new things or methods, that is, the concrete outcome of creativity. And finally, I would distinguish innovation from entrepreneurship. They're related, but the entrepreneur uh, is engaged in the process of assembling the necessary factors of production consisting of human, physical, and information resources. Let me offer a few cautions here, uh, because I don't want to make claims that, that are uh, too strong, can't be supported. In my view, the conditions for success in innovation and entrepreneurship are complex. A lot of visitors come to Stanford in search of the formula for success in entrepreneurship so that they can create their own Silicon Valley. Uh, I think it's impossible to give a full and conclusive answer to the question of how to replicate that success. I, I uh, fondly remember a visit several years ago of the German Chancellor Angela Merkel to the Stanford campus. I had dinner with her in the president's house, and I thought that was a quite striking turn of events because Stanford was founded in 1891 on the model of the German research university, and it has a German motto. And then in 2010, Angela Merkel came to the campus of Stanford to ask how she could model German universities on Stanford. 
Uh, a, a, a caution that I want to suggest is that the quantifiable proxies for innovation and entrepreneurship uh, are, uh, are just that, they're proxies. They do not fully capture the phenomena uh, that are in, involved in innovative entrepreneurship. Economists choose measurable indices of success, but none of those indices fully capture the phenomena, they are simplifications. And in fact, in my view, if, if they're pursued for their own sake, they can actually turn out to have uh, uh, counterproductive consequences. And then the final caveat is that I think it's impossible to specify sufficient conditions that explain Stanford's success. But it is possible, I think, to suggest some necessary conditions. Uh, in my eight years at Stanford, I've heard many speeches uh, about the ingredients for success in Silicon Valley, but frankly, I've never heard one that was rigorous and uh, completely convincing in social scientific terms. Uh, the problem is that any feature of Stanford and Silicon Valley that one can identify as a cause of success can be found in other places as well, and they haven't produced a Silicon Valley. So let me briefly describe uh, some of the research findings from the economists. The argument of Kruger and Kumar is that general university education prepares graduates to participate in technological advance better than skill-specific education. Skill-specific education promotes technological imitation and adoption, whereas general education promotes innovation. And let me quote from their conclusion. General education is more costly to obtain, but enables workers to operate new technologies incorporated into production. An economy whose policies favor vocational education, and they're thinking here of the continental European universities, uh, these uh, economies will grow slower in equilibrium than one that favors general education the model in the United States. Moreover, the gap between their growth rates will increase with the rate of growth of, of the available technology. Our theory suggests that European education policies that favored specialized vocational education might have worked well, both in terms of growth rates and welfare, during the 60s and 70s, when new available technologies changed slowly. In the information age of the 80s and 90s, when new technologies emerged at a more rapid pace, however, it may have suboptimally contributed to slow growth and may have increased the growth gap relative to the US. Now, this article was published 10 years ago, and uh, it's safe to say that things have changed a bit in the meantime. Uh, and the story is more mixed now. There are some European economies that have at least matched the American economy over the last decade. But the argument does have intuitive appeal, I think. It's reasonable to think that economic growth depends, however, on more factors than just the curriculum in higher education. And so I want to say a few words just to describe an, another line of study even if higher education is a principal reason for differences in economic growth, US and European higher education have many differences uh, apart from just the curriculum. And these are complex and, in, and relate in different ways. For example, the systems of governance and of allocating resources are quite different in European universities from American universities. A major feature of US higher education is uh, only minimally constrained, highly competitive environment. We compete for the best faculty, the best students, for research support. And the, the competition for faculty takes place in the form of competitive salaries, uh, competitive research support, and teaching environment. The American system of competition in higher education, I think, is quite successful in matching the most productive faculty to the most productive resources. And here, a, a kind of key finding comes from Jonathan Cole, who was provost for years at Columbia. 
Uh, Professor Cole found that in the sciences, the 5% of most productive scientists produce 50% of the science. In other words, there's a steep stratification, and as a result, there is a great advantage in matching the, the best resources to the most productive faculty. Now, there are some disadvantages to this competitive environment in the United States. In particular, with the decline of state support for higher education, the public universities have suffered declining resources and have become more and more dependent on private uh, tuition and donations, and in that they're behind the leading private universities. Now, the study of Aggie and Hoxby uh, and, and others uh, emphasize that in order to be productive, this competitive context has to be linked to autonomy. So those two things go together, university autonomy and a competitive environment. And the idea is that universities will respond if they have the opportunity to the competition. And that's certainly what I feel at Stanford. But all of that has to be in the right kind of context. So another of their findings is that uh, that, that competition is most productive in an environment close to the technological frontier. And what they mean by that is a big investment in the highest and most advanced research in a state like Alaska or Kentucky is not likely to be very productive. Those investments in, in research will be productive in states that are at the frontier of technological research. And in particular, they, they point to California and Massachusetts. The third uh, area of economics research that I want to mention has to do with entrepreneurship. And here the argument of Edward Lazier is that entrepreneurship is best nurtured by general rather than skill-specific education. Entrepreneurship is related to, but it's different from innovation. It's the process of developing innovations into full-scale production. Lazier's argument is that entrepreneurs have to be jacks of all trade. And, and they need balance, a balance of skills and varied experience. Now, I find this economics research intuitively plausible, but I also think that it's very hard to, to prove in a rigorous empirical way uh, the, the kinds of connections that they postulate. So now I want to turn to what Stanford is doing in the way of curriculum. Stanford makes a quite conscious effort to stimulate uh, creativity both at an institutional level and then at an individual level. At an institutional level, we believe that it's quite important that Stanford uniquely, ha among its peers, uniquely has a campus that includes seven top-ranked schools all across the street from one another. So my school, Humanities and Sciences, which include the basic sciences, School of Engineering, Earth Sciences, Law, Medicine, Business, and Education. We believe that this encourages interactions across disciplines and across schools. So, for example, having a medical school on campus turns out to be fairly unusual in the United States. What it does is it gives doctors the opportunity to teach undergraduates not, not only biomedical subjects, but also uh, literature connected with medicine, uh, and other topics. Or to take another example, the fact that we have the business school uh, close to the arts uh, gives the possibility of a new program in which uh, we, we teach students arts management. We institutionalize those uh, connections between the schools in the form of what we call independent labs. Those are uh, institutes that combine faculty from different schools. So, for example, the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies draws together political scientists, historians, economists, uh, faculty from the medical school in public health to deal with problems of public health around the world, issues like smoking. Or to take another example, we have a center on longevity that draws faculty from all seven schools. 
and it tackles issues such as uh, financial security for the elderly or mobility, physical mobility for the elderly. We have a Clayman Institute for Gender Studies that draws faculty together to consider, for example, how gender affects scientific research. In general, we believe in the value of diversity. We believe that diversity begets creativity. And the argument here is that if you draw together students and faculty from different backgrounds who have different experiences, they're going to look at things in different ways and challenge one another. Stanford is a remarkably diverse university right now. Among our 6,800 undergraduates, the majority are from minority groups. One third of our graduate students come from abroad. And we're working to diversify our faculty, particularly uh, to draw more women into the sciences and mathematics and engineering. This can produce interesting results. As I said, the Clayman Institute has been doing a lot of work on the subject of how uh, the choice of, of gender affects medical research. Our new curriculum is designed to nurture creativity in individual students. Several years ago, the provost charged uh, a task force to study undergraduate education at Stanford. Their goal is expressed in the quotation I've, I've cited here. We want, to, we want our students not simply to succeed, but to flourish. We want them to live not only usefully, but also creatively, responsibly, and reflectively. The premise here is the long-term value of an education is to be found not merely in the accumulation of knowledge or skills, but in the capacity to forge fresh connections between them, to, in, to integrate different elements from one's education and experience and bring them to bear on, on new challenges and problems. A major part of the new curriculum that we have is a, a series of requirements that are encompassed in the phrase ways of thinking. The goal here is to teach students different approaches to problems and issues. The first four of these listed here are pretty conventional and can be found on many university campuses as distribution requirements. So we require students to take a couple of courses in scientific reasoning, a couple of courses in quantitative analysis, a couple of courses in social inquiry. The last four in red have to do with the humanities and arts. The last three, I think, are less common among universities in the United States. So let me, let me take each one of the humanities and arts requirements in turn. Students are asked to take two courses in interpretive and aesthetic inquiry. This involves reading of literature or the study of the arts. We do this for several reasons. The first is to stimulate the imagination. As a classicist, I'm struck by the fact that uh, the entertainment industry in Hollywood in the United States continues to look back to the creativity of the ancient Greeks and Romans for the themes that they use in movies and other kinds of artistic production. We believe that reading about those themes will help fire the imagination. The second reason has to do with developing a more sophisticated theory of mind. Theory of mind is a concept of what I impute to my interlocutors by way of motives, uh, uh, mental framework, uh, likes and dislikes. A study published in Science a year and a half ago found that students who read high-level sophisticated literature will have a more sophisticated theory of mind, that is, how other, uh, others develop their character. And this, in turn, helps them in many ways in life. Third, we believe that studying humanities and arts helps students grapple with ambiguity and uncertainty in subjects in which there is no one right answer. Now, on the Stanford campus, I think it's safe to say that uh, many of the engineering students uh, find it frustrating to 
to uh, take subjects, courses in subjects in which there's no one right answer. Uh, they label it, they, they label it the, with the category of fuzzy. Um, but the truth is, of course, in the real world, many issues and problems don't have one right answer. And one needs to be accustomed to analyzing issues that are more complex, uh, 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 more puzzling. And then finally, there's the traditional rationale for a liberal education in the humanities, and that is uh, development of language skills. That is, the ability to read a text closely and accurately, to provide a careful interpretation of the text and precise use of language. In my decades of teaching, I, I found that uh, imprecise language often reflects sloppy thinking, and we are uh, making an effort to develop students' precision in this way. The next two requirements are related but different. Ethical reasoning and engaging difference. Before the 1960s, uh, most American universities had a requirement that really aimed to inculcate particular social values in the students. Uh, and this was often done through uh, a course in the history of Western civilization, which was designed to acquaint students with traditional European values. With the turmoil on campuses in the 1960s and 70s, those requirements went away. And then I think more recently, we found that uh, uh, not providing students with some kind of ethical foundation leads to real problems, notably some of the corporate uh, scandals uh, that the United States has experienced over the last 10 or 15 years. As a result, we've made an effort to revive uh, a requirement for ethical reasoning, but it's a, a requirement with a difference. We no longer try to inc inculcate a particular set of values, but rather to inculcate in the students a sense of a need for an ethical foundation and then their own capacity to engage in the critical reasoning that's necessary for they themselves to come up with a strong foundation. The reason for not teaching a specific ethical thought is that, as I said, the Stanford campus now is very diverse with regard to culture, with regard to uh, religion. We have to acknowledge the fact that there is no one ethical uh, set, of value, set of ethical values that will uh, guide every student and graduate. This is the rationale then for a requirement on engaging difference, to, help, to, to provide courses that help students think about fellow students and others in the society who have different values come out of different religious backgrounds. And this kind of exposure to difference is in itself, I think, a stimulus to creativity. Uh, as a historian of classical antiquity, I know that as early as the ancient Greeks, their contacts with, uh, with Near Eastern cultures uh, that were other than Greek were a great stimulus to their remarkable creativity. The final requirement is creative expression, and this one is probably the one that's most unusual, most innovative in the Stanford curriculum. The goal here is to balance the teaching of high-order knowledge with that of hands-on application. We intend to force students out of the habit of passive learning to become creators of products for which there's no preconceived correct end. So students can satisfy this requirement by taking courses in creative writing, or in painting, or musical performance, dance, or product design. Uh, dean Jim Plummer, who had a remarkable uh, term of 15 years as dean of the School of Engineering, in his farewell address just about a year ago, was very eloquent on the need for his engineering students to have a serious engagement with, with the humanities in order to, and arts in order to stimulate their creativity. After students finish their general education requirements, they go on to majors. Uh, in my school, the biggest majors now are in interdepartmental programs that cut across the traditional disciplines. So the most popular majors right now are human biology, 
which brings together biological sciences with the social sciences, science, technology, and society, which brings together engineering, science, and again, social sciences and humanities, symbolic systems, which brings together computer science, linguistics, psychology, and philosophy, uh, international relations, a more traditional interdisciplinary program, and then product design, which brings together courses in the art department with mechanical engineering. A common feature of all these majors is that they start from a core sequence of courses that every student takes, and then students are able to follow different tracks by pursuing courses from many departments, including courses in the humanities and arts. We now have more students enrolled in these interdisciplinary majors than in any of the science or social science or engineering, or um, sorry, humanities majors. And we believe that it's not only the very variety of subject matter that's important, but also the modes of delivery and engagement of students. Stanford students are selected to be doers rather than just thinkers. And this shows up in the kind of courses that we offer. We believe that learning is much more effective if the student is actively engaged, regardless of the subject matter. Uh, being a passive listener in a lecture hall, um, you may not remember much of this uh, in a couple of hours. But uh, if you were actually involved in teaching a course at Stanford, you, you would remember, I'm sure. So let me give you a, a selection of the kinds of courses that we offer, the different kinds of formats of courses that we offer. First, the freshman seminars. President Gerhard Casper, 20 years ago, made this one of his signature curricular changes at Stanford because he believed that it was important to bring senior Stanford faculty into direct contact with the students. And so we offer about 200 freshman seminars a year on campus. Uh, they are all taught by senior faculty. I teach one. Um, and they involve no more than 15 students sitting around a table in a seminar room. This gives students an opportunity to express their own views, to criticize one another's views, and to ask questions. The only important feature is that the faculty member pick a subject that is of passionate interest to her to convey that interest. So I'm teaching a freshman seminar this coming fall on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, one of the reasons that I select that as a topic is that it's one of those uh, big topics in which there is no right answer. After all, historians have been arguing for 200 years at least uh, about why the Roman Empire declined and ultimately fell. The students in, in this seminar read and debate among themselves, and they discover that some arguments are better than others, but that there is no final resolution, no final answer to the question of why the Roman Empire fell. Another quite different example uh, is a seminar entitled The Aesthetics of Data, Aesthetic Principles in Effective Dis Data Display and the Creative Potential of Scientific, Biological, Environmental, and Other Data as Inspiration for Artistic Expression. The goal of this course is to introduce freshmen to the integration of science and the arts. Stanford students are very ambitious to cram as much into the regular school year as they can. And so one of the trends uh, that's been increasing over the years is to offer short three-week courses outside the regular academic year. Over the summer, even one-week courses between terms during the school year. Uh, one of the, the most interesting, I think, is the arts intensive seminars. These are short three-week seminars that begin before the start of the academic year. They're designed to give students in demanding non-arts majors, particularly engineering, an opportunity to try their hand at some genre of art. And there are no grades. So, for example, one of these seminars is entitled Design Thinking and the Art of Innovation. It provide students with the tools for need finding, ethnography, structured brainstorming, rapid prototyping, 
visual communication and storytelling. And the, the seminar travels to some of the uh, most innovative corporations in the Bay Area to see how this works on the ground. At Stanford, we allow students to create their own courses. I have to say, as a, an old Chicago type, I shudder at this. Um, <laughs> Uh, but in fact, the students are very creative. They don't get credit for the courses, but they do get the opportunity to, dis to, to pick topics that are of significance of, to them and then to figure out how to organize the content. More and more, we are creating community, what we call community-engaged courses. These are courses that include activities that meet academic learning goals through structured off-campus experiences. The courses often partner with community organizations in a way that meets both academic learning goals and real-world community needs. One of the most popular is a course entitled Community Health in Oaxaca, Mexico. This introduces students to social, economic, and cultural factors impacting the health of Mexicans and Mexican-American immigrants. Students broaden their public health knowledge they increase their competency in Spanish. They get exposure to healthcare systems and clinical interactions in other cultures. The program offers opportunities for close observation of clinicians at work in another society. Next on my list is student research opportunities. Stanford invests very heavily, about $5 million a year, in support of student research now, some of this in, it takes students into labs, uh, science labs on campus, and I think one of the very great uh, um, advantages that Stanford students have is the opportunity to participate in research with scientists who are leading the world in their subject. But it also provides opportunities for humanities students to develop their own research project. The whole point is to get students actively pursuing knowledge on their own rather than just passively absorbing it. One of the, uh, one of the most famous programs now at Stanford is the design school, the D school. What's interesting about this program is that it has very little formal academic standing. It, it makes no professorial appointments on its own. Uh, it, it is a school that preaches the importance of human values, of collaborative approach. It creates spectacularly transformative teaching, er, learning experiences. It imbues students with a methodology for innovation that provides uh, creative and analytical approaches and requires collaboration across the disciplines. This process, which has been called design thinking, draws on methods from engineering and design and combines them with ideas from the arts, tools from the social sciences, and insights from the business world. I think what's really critical about this is that students are asked not only to solve a problem, but to define a problem. Students start in the field where they develop empathy for people they design for, uncovering real human needs they want to address. And then they iterate to develop an unexpected range of possible solutions and create prototypes to take back into the field and test with real people. And then finally, we have a whole array of inter-school programs, such as product design, which I mentioned before, or digital humanities that combine computer science uh, and, and the humanities. So let me conclude by returning to that trio of creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship. I want to go back to the definitions and consider the interplay among those definitions. In my view, uh, the humanities and arts broaden and enrich the imagination, encouraging students to think more creatively. Marrying that creativity to great engineering injects the pragmatism to bring the imagination to fruitful, concrete outcomes, that is, innovations that work. The general education, including the social sciences, helps to prepare jacks of all trade who then can become entrepreneurs. But I don't want to end 
this talk on a pragmatic utilitarian note, as if the only value of art, literature, philosophy, and history were uh, pragmatic technological progress. I think that these subjects also have their own inherent value in elevating our humanity. Uh, and an illustration of this is what I want to end with. Uh, these are pots that were excavated in Turkey at the uh, site of Katil Hulyuk, which is being excavated by Stanford faculty. It's a, a World Heritage site. What's striking about these pots that come from 6000 BC is that the earliest potters went to considerable lengths to, to decorate the pots. Now that decoration doesn't make the pots one whit more useful, right? In terms of carrying liquids or grain or whatever, they would do just as well without the decoration. The point is that it's intrinsic in our humanity to try to make the world around us more beautiful. And I think that that's part of the arts and humanities that, that we should not forget. Thank you very much.